With the League of Venice arrayed against him, Charles was forced to abandon his position in Naples and head back north, but was intercepted by an Italian army commanded by Francesco Gonzaga. The League army aimed to block their opponent's retreat, which was slowed by the mountains and need to occasionally sack cities which stood in their path. Despite some failed negotiations, they shattered the French, launching periodic light cavalry raids and getting the better of a few small skirmishes, but mostly avoiding direct confrontation. Before we get to the battle itself, it would be best to at least briefly describe the opposing armies. The French army was somewhat of a mixed bag. It was without a doubt one of the best in Europe, as it had great artillery, but still relied on the shock charge of heavy cavalry, armored in the best armor of the day, and equipped with lances, heavy swords, and maces. Though improvements to infantry had been made in the past few decades, the French still often fielded relatively poor indigenous forces of foot soldiers, which was at least in part a result of the class divide between nobles and commoners. Furthermore, Swiss mercenaries, who had gained the reputation as being among the best infantry in Europe at this time, were extensively employed by France. Italian states relied largely on conductory mercenaries, who were often mounted men-at-arms, like the French, but also included some infantry. Furthermore, foreign troops were not uncommon, particularly Albanian light cavalry called Stradiots, who were recruited from Venetian-held territories in the Balkans. These men were prized as ruthless, irregular fighters, known for their habit of taking the heads of deceased foes. The French were able to make it across the River Taro safely before Francesco's army caught up to them. There was a brief artillery duel, but the French still attempted to continue retreating, their army divided into three main sections. The vanguard, which included most of the elite Swiss and artillery, and was likely the most powerful. The center, which had many of the gendarmes and stood adjacent to King Charles. The smaller rearguard, and the baggage train, which was loaded with piles of loot taken from many Italian cities, and which at the moment appeared to have been stuck, unable to move quickly. The League Light Cavalry followed Charles closely, and crossed the river behind the French. They then took shelter in some nearby hills until they were ready to strike. Both sides fired their artillery once more, though it did not seem to have had great or decisive effect. The League held council and began drawing up a complex and elaborate stratagem to defeat the French. Under this plan, the Milanese were to cross the river and divert the French vanguard. This would expose the French center, thus allowing Francesco Gonzaga's division to launch the main assault against the weakened French center and Charles himself. The offensive was to be an intricate combined arms operation, in which the heavy cavalry would charge first, acting as a sledgehammer of sorts to smash through enemy ranks, closely followed by light cavalry and then infantry to exploit the initial breakthrough. Further to the left, Fortebraccio's force of cavalry and infantry would cross in support. At the same time, the League's Stradiots, Albanian light cavalry and Venetian service, would swoop down from their positions and complete the pincer movement, attacking the outnumbered French force from the rear. Much of the army, including the bulk of the foot, were to be kept in reserve at specific locations, so they could reinforce and exploit the first wave, when and where they were needed. Francesco now prepared to put his carefully organized master plan into effect. The assault began. At first, some of the light cavalry attempted a premature attack on the French center, but were driven back by French men-at-arms and Scottish archers. At some point, likely a bit later, 
The incentive to loot the French baggage train and camp overrode their desire to participate in the battle, and they would play no further significant role in combat. The main offensive started with the Count of Cayazzo's Milanese division crossing the river and attacking the French vanguard. Unfortunately for the Milanese, they were facing a phalanx of Swiss mercenary pikemen, some of the best foot soldiers in Europe. After a brief struggle, most of the League horse fled and recrossed the river, forcing their foot to now continue alone. Some of the foot soldiers attempted to overrun the French guns, but the Swiss counterattacked, and despite a spirited effort by Milanese infantry and German mercenaries, they too were driven back with heavy losses. Meanwhile, Francesco attempted to cross and attack the French center, while Fortebraccio's horse rushed ahead of their supporting infantry to assail the French rearguard. However, due to the Taro's flooding, he had to ford further upstream than the plan had originally intended. Thus, the French center and rearguard had time to move position and meet this assault. Still, Francesco's charge nearly managed to break through the French lines. It soon turned into a bloody melee, as the French crashed into the Italian flank, and leaders of both armies were themselves at risk. Francesco's uncle, Rudolfo, was slain, badly fracturing the Italian chain of command and preventing aid from swiftly arriving, since Rudolfo had been responsible for bringing up reinforcements. While Francesco himself fought quite bravely, being in the thick of melee, he was unable to appreciate the full tactical picture and act quickly enough to respond to the ever-changing situation. The League army gradually lost its cohesion as some of the Italian supporting cavalry rushed ahead to join the Stradiots in looting the enemy's camp. And although the men-at-arms fought with great tenacity, outmatched by French gendarmes, they were inevitably routed. The Italian warfare during this time can hardly be described as bloodless. Dismounted or wounded men-at-arms often imagined that they would merely be captured and ransomed back. They were in for a very nasty shock though, as French infantry and servants brutally executed the men as they remained helpless and isolated often stabbing through gaps in their armor and risers to perform the coup de grace. Some of the League infantry belatedly made their way across the Terror River to join the fray, but without any real coordination, they too were cut down or driven off by French men-at-arms and supporting units. Indeed, even while this disaster was unfolding, much of the League army sat stationary, having never received an order to move forward and assist their comrades. However, as the French rushed ahead to drive their opponents from the field, they nearly abandoned their king, who was soon attacked by a small group of Italian men-at-arms who remained on that bank of the river. Charles was almost overcome, and only a skilled defense by a bodyguard and the timely arrival of the rest of Charles' retinue saved the monarch from possible capture or death. By afternoon, the battle came to a halt as League units retreated back across the river to lick their wounds. Some advisors in the French camp, including Conrad Thierry Trevolzio, suggested a timely counterattack to finish off their opponents. But others countered that their army was spent and tired, while much of the Leagues had not yet been engaged. Furthermore, the French camp had been thoroughly sacked by some of the League's light cavalry, depriving them of countless loot and treasures, including a pornographic book of Italian beauties which had belonged to Charles, not to mention their tents and sleeping areas. After a night of sleeping on the hard ground, the French retreated north to Asti without a serious league attempt to follow them. Their figures are difficult to estimate. The French likely suffered around 1,000 casualties, whereas the league may have lost around 2,000. Significant, probably not crippling to either army. In the immediate aftermath, both sides claim victory, and as the French continued to limp back north, the implications of the battle 
may not have been seen right away. Although probably not immediately decisive, nevertheless, it soon became clear that the Italians had suffered a significant humiliation. Despite outnumbering their opponents by at least two to one, they had failed to inflict a decisive defeat onto the isolated French army. Their force suffered more casualties than that of the French, and their best mounted soldiers had been definitively repulsed. On that day, the prestige of Italian arms had suffered a severe blow, as one commentator put it several decades later. Italy lost her ancient military renown. Foreign nations, which had been in awe of us until a short while before, began to regard us with shameful contempt, and to the deplorable results of this unfortunate battle are to be attributed the miseries which have since come upon us in the enslavement of Italy. In Naples, despite the previous success at Seminara, the French position eventually proved untenable, and the garrison was driven out. Back in France, Charles died a few years later in 1498, and thus made no further efforts in Italy. An observer at the time could have suspected that things had now reverted back to their normal state of affairs. Nevertheless, the actions of the young and perhaps rather foolish French king had profound implications, and this would only be the beginning of the conflict he started. Future kings of France would continue to act upon their ambitions in Italy, drawing more and more players into the struggle, and leaving the Italian peninsula war-torn and devastated for decades to come. The native states of Italy, long proudly independent, would find that independence challenged and gradually eroded by outside powers, as their homelands became a battleground for the great empires of Europe, a calamitous shift foreshadowed by this French incursion.